Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of a bed. Short stories by Tao Lin. So Tao Lin is one of those authors where, for some reason, I tend to get quite a lot of backlash if I just say that I'm reading him. Like I've had like negative comments and people going through and disliking a whole bunch of videos and stuff just because I was reading Tao Lin. So there's that. I'm going to go ahead and read the blurb. Then I'm going to check out my tabs and share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. College students, recent graduates and their parents work at Denny's, volunteer at a public library in suburban Florida, attend satanic ska punk concerts, eat Chinese food with the homeless of New York City, and go to the same Japanese restaurant in Manhattan three times in two sleepless days, all while yearning constantly for love, a better kind of love, or something better than love, things which, much like the Loch Ness Monster, they know probably do not exist, but are rumoured to exist and are therefore good enough. So here, this first short story is Love is a Thing on Sale for More Money Than There Exists, which I think is a great title. I'm going to read you the opening paragraph. This was the month that people began to suspect that terrorists had infiltrated middle America, set up underground tunnels in the rural areas like gophers. During any moment, it was feared, a terrorist might tunnel up into your house and replace your dog with something that resembled your dog but was actually a bomb. This was a new era in terrorism. The terrorists were now quicker, wittier and more streetwise. They spoke the vernacular and claimed to be philosophically sound. They would, whisper into the, they would whisper into the wind something mordant and culturally damning about McDonald's, Jesus and America. And then if they wanted to, if the situation eschatologically called for it, they would slice your face off with a KFC spork. And we get this paragraph here where the title is used, um, but I think it's an interesting paragraph as well. At the anti-war meeting, they wanted to abolish the words we, us and them. Some others wanted to abolish the word I. They were frustrated. We this, we that, us this, them that, us versus them. No wonder things are the way they are. They wanted semantic unity. They were going to make friends with the terrorists. That was their plan. An older man, a professor, stood and made the case that the terrorists did not want any new friends, had enough friends already, too many actually, that what they really wanted was romantic love. He was probably a graduate student. Another man stood and said, love is a thing on sale for more money than there exists. It seemed an inappropriately capitalist thing to say, or else much too cynical, and the man was ignored. Finally it was settled. Whatever happened, they would just make friends. There were sign-up sheets, and then a six-piece jazz rock band played. The drummer had six cymbals, four of them tiny. People eyed him askance. Was six cymbals, four of them tiny, appropriate for wartime? I thought this was an interesting little line. Um, Garrett's mother made a cake. To Garrett and Christy with love, long and happy lives, said the cake. They watched a lot of TV, the three of them on the sofa. Terrorism, polls showed, was now believed to be the largest threat to human safety, ahead of cancer, heart disease, suburban gangs, piranhas, and swimming on a full stomach. And there we get, though if love was an animal, Garrett knew, it would probably be the Loch Ness Monster. If it didn't exist, that didn't matter. People made models of it, put it in the water and took photos. The hopes of it was good enough. The idea of it. Though some people feared it, wished it would just go away, had their lives insured against being eaten alive by it. And this metaphor of love as the Loch Ness Monster is kind of repeated throughout these stories, which is why the Loch Ness Monster is also on the cover. So on to the next story, Three Day Cruise. So I thought this was a good exchange. Death is the plural of death, says Paul. It's when everything goes deaf. Oh, says Christine. She stands up, sits back down. Death is an emotion outside all the other emotions, Matty says, looking at Christine, who has a worried expression on her face. A comet, black blue, fast as ice. She is quoting one of her poems. The next line is a non sequitur. The men look two inches into my forehead, as are the next couple of lines. I ask for no receipt, but I'm given a receipt, forced to take it home, unfurl it, like a scroll, staple a wall to it. There are more lines, a rant on the bronze dirtiness of pennies. It is a long poem. Matty skips to the end. Death is a highly polished thought. She feels dazed and shy and a cool. So on to suburban teenage wasteland blues. This has another pretty good opening, so I'm gonna read that out. That kind of gnawing offness that Greg always felt, that constant knowledge that he was doomed in small but myriad ways, intensified in the presence of people, became immediate and insufferable, like a rat in the stomach. So after his parents sold the house and retired to California, Greg moved alone into an apartment behind a run-down 24-hour supermarket. There he drank coffee and watched the History Channel. His meals became larger and less often, like a crocodile's. He'd eat an entire package of bacon or a box of frosty muffins, sleep for 20 hours, and then masturbate languishingly to all his crushes from middle and high school. He became nocturnal and strange, taking on all the impatience and bipolarity of a young child without any of the charm or smooth complexion. Sometimes he'd catch himself speaking in his head to objects, 
a thing of food, a box of Kleenex, a door. Hesitate, but then continue. Keep on going with what he wanted to say. Finish it off out loud, because what did it matter either way? Here we have Sincerity, and again, it has another great opening. <laughs> it made me laugh. I think it's relatable, personally. Once, while having sex with his girlfriend, Alicia, the theme from Star Wars had gone into Aaron's head, and he had suddenly and loudly begun to hum it, which he could not then sustain, as he had started to laugh. He laughed and laughed. And things changed after that. Sex became a precarious thing. Often it could not happen. Songs or tunes, little ditties, tom-tom drum beats, kazooie cartoon music would automatically go into both their heads. The required focus and grave seriousness of sex, that inner outer spacey concentration towards some black and scrappy source, some vague but findable piece of lust. It could not happen anymore. Only songs could happen. And there were other changes. Their quarrels, they had always fought took on a tone of mocking and farce. Sometimes now, fighting with Alicia, both of them yelling, shrieking at times and crying even like babies. Something in Aaron would scold white and clean, like a flash pasteurization, and he would tickle her until she fell down giggling. Or he would just start laughing, then have to chase down and tickle her to sort of convince her, delude her, of his otherwise unacceptable behavior. And Alicia too underwent change, having once during a fight opened a drawer and taken from it a glass of water. She had premeditated it, and, after telling Aaron sincerely that he was an asshole, grinned and poured the water on his head. We get this the, these little exchange here. What about community college, the teacher said. I think those have literary value. Community colleges with minority makeups have literary value, Aaron said. He remembered something. A few days ago he had joked about community colleges, condescendingly, Alicia had thought. And then they fought, had said something about the vague leper colonies of them. Community colleges on the west coast have beach value. Another great extract here. Uh, but Aaron was not good at delusion. He had, in his life he suspected, learned something, grasped some knowledge, in a once and random adolescent way, like chicken pox, or else in a work that way, like a skill. Probably somehow both, that prevented him from moving entirely into the delusion of a thing. And he had learned this something very early in his life, he knew, as he could not remember ever having really believed in anything. Not in religion, which made him restless, the cul-de-sac of it. How it turned you around a little, patted you on the head, held block parties in celebration of itself. Not in society, with its earnest system of non-existence. How it existed, really, in the unhappen future, in progress and realisation. And not in himself, as what did it mean to believe in oneself? Wasn't that just a sneaky way of proclaiming yourself God? It was, and Aaron especially did not believe in anything as vague and clichéd, and with as many capitulation rules, as God. And um, the, the page after that we get this. In class they discussed Aaron's story about his parents, which Aaron had given up on, leaving in, among other things that should have been cut, a non sequitur about their mother's son feeling fluttered and doomed as a hummingbird with a spinal disease, and a description of the father's head that was intended to imply worry, but instead implied, if anything, Aaron knew, cold sliced bologna. His pocked and boyish eyes stuck like salt-washed olives in the peppered meat of his face. It was called Eddie, which was the name of the son in the story. Aaron had wanted to avoid in the title irony, cleverness, smugness, frivolousness, profanity, profundity, melodrama, condescension, and had ended up not with sincerity, he felt, but a woozy, resounding sort of tonelessness, and maybe a little, or possibly a lot of, irony. And this is also an interesting thing I thought, and it's kind of one of those, those thoughts that I think most of us have. Why does Aaron stay with Alicia if he doesn't love her really, Aaron said. They had become very open with one another recently had both admitted, among other things that made them nervous, having wished sudden and accidental deaths onto their parents, as they were both fearful and unwanting of what would otherwise happen. Their parents would still die, of course, eventually, but what before that? Fifteen years of Alzheimer's, dementia, cancer. Aaron and Alicia felt they would not be able to deal with any of those. It had brought them closer, Aaron felt. In the, fair, in the farness of their worrying, the tedious escape of it, how it shuttled you slowly away from real life, into a sort of deep space. They had come, truly, closer to each other, in an echoed, gaping expanse between them, way. Or not. Probably not. I thought this was nice as well. Uh, I disagree with that, Aaron said. Everyone should realise that everything is arbitrary, and so nothing is, which is also true. And so everyone should try and be nice to their family, in the way that everyone should be maximally nice to everyone. Start with your family, Aaron thought without much conviction. That's what a person needed to do. That was the given task, probably. The world's free and weary advice. And from there, then, spread out from family to include, gradually, everyone else. I'm profound, he said aloud, by accident, but effectively, as some people laughed. So we get this line, Alicia should do drugs, someone said. Then her family can worry about her and she won't have to worry anymore. 
and later she can write a raw, unflinching, but ultimately redemptive novel or memoir about it. And we get this little bit I enjoyed. I like you too, Alicia said. They talk no longer of love, but only of light. Talk of love made them feel banished and of the dark ages. Like was beginning and new. Like was when you grew wings that made you lithe and interesting. Love was when those wings kept growing, became thick and unseemly, tarp-like, and then smothered you, wrapped you up like a body bag. So we're going to move on to love is the indifferent god of the religion in which universe is church. And they eat broccoli and fried tofu, which sounds tasty. And then they uh, talk about watching a movie, Mutant Turtles, Splinter's Big Revenge. That sounds like a hell of a good day to me, to be honest. We also get a reference to Christmas, which was interesting, because I mean, at the time of filming, it's currently the 29th of December. And uh, we got this bit. I want to be in love and out of this place, Sean thought immediately. And then felt the nausea of that thought, the massive animal flu of it. He didn't want anything ever, he thought extravagantly. Actually, he knew exactly what he wanted. He had thought about this before, last week when he was kind of depressed. He wanted to enter into himself, sit inside his own body, and look out from there to see what he would do. He wanted to continue doing things, but wanted just to watch that happen, and not actually do anything. Uh, this little just quote amused me. Your eyebrows are going to grow muscles if you keep looking that way. Do you want big eyebrow muscles on your face? So this one, I just love the title of it. It's called Call the Steel Heart, Melt the Ice One, Love the Weak Thing. Say nothing of consolation but irrelevance, disaster and non-existence. Have no hope or hate, nothing. Ruin yourself exclusively, completely and whenever possible. But I don't actually have anything I want to say about that. Then we have 910 and this is another one with a great start. People got a bit careless that year. Band-aids were forgotten. Sm small wounds allowed to go a little out of control, to infect a bit. Jobs were quit. People woke early evening or mid-afternoon, fisted ice cream bars, wandered from their homes, only a little bit depressed, and walked diagonally through parking lots. They felt no longer in the midst of things, but in the misty aftermath of things, the quaint and narcotic haze of what comes after, a haze in which nothing they knew could ever fully, truly happen. Anything there was could only yearn for itself at a distance, behind barricades, could only long for the real self of itself. The core of things, of love and life, of any simple feeling or thought, could no longer be experienced centre on, could no longer be thought of or felt directly, but only in trying, in ticks and glimpses, in ways holographic and fleeting. And another great paragraph here. Uh, they were in their late 20s, had both married young to early girl and boyfriends, were both aware of the basic eschatology of things, though in different ways. Jed's dad could sense the end of life as a place you got to, some place far away and separate like Hawaii, could sometimes see it, that it was a nice place with trees, a king-sized bed. LJ's mum couldn't sense that place. Hers was the view, the experience, that every moment was a little death, that you were never really alive because you were always dying. And in this way she sensed, instead, everything swirling around her, felt the slow fast blur of each movement, the raking of it, the future grinding through her, to the past and crushing, and crashing at times, like a truck, through her skull. Sometimes, walking around the house or doing whatever, she would suddenly feel smashed in the head with sadness or disbelief or some other disorientating method. Days would go by, then weeks or months before she recovered. And I, lo I love this paragraph too. Uh, she lay on her gigantic bed, stomach down and splay limbed. She felt plain. She thought of getting drunk or something. Maybe she should dye her hair. She began to adjust the hardness of her mattress. She had bought one of those mattresses. There was a fact out there she felt that she didn't know. There was a fact that you had to know in order to live. There was a knowing to being alive and she just didn't know. She closed her eyes, listened to the little mattress motor, working harder, and began to think on her life, tracing it forward and back in a squiggled, redundant way. She thought, without much conviction, that if she concentrated hard enough, if she started carefully in her childhood and moved forward, gaining momentum, then when she reached the present moment, she might be able to turn it, her life, like a pipe cleaner, might be able to twist it, attitudinally, in some new and pleasant direction. And then somebody phones somebody up and goes, I'm drunk, I'm doing 110 on the highway, and all I could think about was stand by Eminem. And we get this, uh, ill. He didn't want to say that it would all be okay, that things would get better. Things would get worse, he knew. There would be old age, cancer, arthritis, global warming, tidal waves, acid rain. Life was just a tiny moonstruck thing, really, and the world was just a small, failed place. We'll go out, he said. He was bad at optimism, at invigoration, or whatever this was right now. You, me, Jed, LJ, we'll go to the beach. Uh, and so there's a big chunk here I want to read out that I thought was great. Nationwide, there was, at first, a time of increased lawmaking. Things were generally banned. There was no trust anywhere, and nothing was acceptable. A bill outlawing love was reportedly being drafted. There was a law that, by accident, outlawed itself. Anything there was had a law for or against it. 
People, having paid fines for whatever infraction, went home more inspired than outraged and wrote their own laws, striving for originality and footnotes. Laissez-faire, they said stupidly, denouement. Other things were said. As more things were said, people became gradually wittier. Anarchy, apathy, and, they said, the three A's. There was a general drift towards the arbitrary, the solipsistic and apolitical. Laws then began to be lifted. The drinking age was lowered, then gotten rid of. It became okay to break any of the smaller laws. A large region of the nation acquiesced to some ancient aphorism espousing playfulness. It was shown on TV how you might empty a packet of Skittles plus all your prescription pills into a fanny pack and take one mystery pill every four to six hours. People grew amused. Cops covered their helmets and firearms, like guitars, with ironic stickers. Mitochondria, said the stickers, but Nuli's law. Helicopter pilots, having discovered that they could do tricks, took to the sky in waves, cityward from the subways, spinning, diving, circling tall buildings, enacting any scene from any movie. When a mistaken copy editing sent an oil liner to the Galapagos Islands, they left it there, crew and all, calling it innovative, a kind of achievement. Then we move on to insomnia for a better tomorrow. And I just, from this one, I just want to read out this little part here. One night after sex, Brian had, instead of making the dash through the kitchen to the bathroom, cleaned himself for paper towels, rolled over and gone to sleep. Chrissy had shaken her head at that, had made an annoyed noise and then run through the kitchen and showered. But soon after, she too began to use paper towels. And then when they ran out of paper towels, they started using toilet paper. And a couple of weeks after that, they stopped having sex. It had become, in too many ways, similar to going to the bathroom. Now they hugged a lot, but rarely kissed. They said things like, instead of saying good night every night, let's just assume that we want each other to have a good night. That way we don't have to feel obligated to say it every night. They looked into each other's eyes and they saw contact lenses. The seized UFOs of them, dumb and shunned as plates. They yawned. They yawned wantonly without covering their mouths. And then finally we have Sasquatch, which I guess kind of rounds off the theme of like the Loch Ness Monster and these cryptids and whatnot. As you can tell from the readings that I did, Tallinn stuff is quite, it's kind of contemporary but with a twist, uh, it's quite experimental at times, but I think he does really well at kind of just capturing the mundanity of life and then like boiling that down into little bits of almost philosophy. Uh, I always have enjoyed Tallinn stuff, I do think his poetry is better than his uh, fiction, but I still gave this a 4 out of 5 and would recommend it. So there we have it, that's what I made of Bed by Taolin. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.